uh, I got into some research on the Pentagon black budget. And I don't know if you recall, but you probably do, that the day before 9-11, Don Rumsfeld announced at a Pentagon news conference that the uh, agency was 2.2 trillion short. Money was simply missing, 2.2, not billion, but trillion. So uh, having worked for a period of time at the Pentagon, I realized this was most likely black budget funds. And I did some investigation and I ran across uh, a couple of areas, uh, basically the deep underground military base research done by Jesse Ventura, done by Phil Schneider, done by other personalities. And I realized, of course, that's likely the source of the lost money. It's black budget ops and it's being spent. And why is it being spent in terms of these type of uh, bases? So that's how my curiosity was was picked, you might say. These bases, I understand, are built away primarily from geologic tectonic areas. But again, when Planet X passes, you're going to have new geotectonic faults established when you have Force 11, 12, 13, 14 earthquakes. So I don't know how safe they're going to be. It could be a lost investment for those people. In any case, that was my basic introduction about five years ago. And then I got into the science of the, of the topic. Well, and science is something that I'd really like to get into today so, you know, we could help the skeptics see some solid evidence to help them prepare, you know, mentally, physically, spiritually, whatever. It sounds like it's going to be difficult in many cases to prepare for this type of event if it is as serious as many predict. Um, you know, different underground bases, they've, they've been building them for years. You can go all the way back 70 years and they were building these things, probably even before that. So... Have they been spending more money since 2001 on these underground bases then? My understanding, and this is partly from Phil Schneider, I know he worked 11 years at Groom Lake Area 51. He says the black budget varies between 0.2 trillion and 1.2 trillion per year. I'm not sure when the inception started. It was absolutely going on in the late 70s and 80s. He says a couple of dozen of these may be reasonable for protection. I agree, nuclear protection. But the question is, why do we have over 130 of these? That doesn't really make any sense unless, obviously, Planet X is, is absolutely a fact, which it is. Well, so, you know, four years ago, I remember reading an article on Yahoo News that claimed eventually people are going to be able to look up in the sky and they're going to see what looks like a second sun but really it's a giant sun that exploded i think they said it was beetlejuice or something like that so in my mind when i read stuff like that in the news i think it's you know the the forces behind the scenes or whoever's kind of orchestrating the media prepping people you know subconsciously getting them ready for this type of event first it's just a an explosion that looks like a sun and then hey oh it is a sun so I mean, do you have any physical evidence, like pictures that you can say without a shadow of a doubt or files or white papers? Yes, I do. In fact, there's some very good videos on the Internet itself that are good photographic analysis. There's one called Multiple Suns Rise Over Halifax, Nova Scotia. Those are the keywords that a person would enter on YouTube to read it or view it. And you can see the sun. And then at the three o'clock position, you have Planet X. To the right of Planet X, you have a separate lens flare. Now that doesn't reflect the lens flare, of course, of the water below, but Planet X is generating its own light and you can see its reflection, therefore, in the water below. Next, I think a fog bank moves in and it obscures the sun, but Planet X is still visible. A lens flare cannot do this. Now that's one good example of something they could simply look up themselves on YouTube. There's also some good uh, Davis Station South Pole videos out there. And there's in my book, which is Planet X, The Arrival in 2017 by David Mead on Amazon. I've done a uh, video, it's uh, page 15 or 16 or so of the book. And I have a section called Photographic Analysis of Planet X. And I study one video, which another analyst did an extensive study on. And let me just sort of explain what happened. A uh, fellow named Glenn Vaughn on April 11th, 2015, 
was flying down the Pacific side of Central America. He's a professor, an ex-professor at a California University. He took a 20 megapixel raw file with a Sony digital camera and he confirmed the report by sending it in to a particular analyst for review. He took it through an aircraft window. Now, an analysis of the metadata indicated it was taken at 240 dpi, very high resolution, and the metadata further showed the date, the time, the GPS coordinates. I think it was a Sony DSC-HX50V camera. In any case, using Starry Night Professional version, the video, which is referenced in my book and which is on YouTube, did a field of view analysis and he determined Mercury is above, in other words, superior conjunction with the Sun and the object in the field of view therefore is not Mercury. Mercury does not have wings as does this object and Mercury does not have the brightness or contrast of the unknown object. Now the analyst also performed a gamma test on a paint program. Gamma testing shows if an object is hot or cold. Hot objects generate of course their own light like our Sun. A lens flare would be a cold object. They read direct light, they don't generate it. So he started with a gamma of 1, reducing it by steps. At point 10, the gamma illustrates stark differences. At point 01, he shows the hottest, brightest objects on the video. He then reduced brightness to a value, I think, of minus 3 in contrast to plus 2. The hot objects fade in together, proving they're genuine. Then he ran a luminance test to determine the intensity of the object, and he determined it was behind the sun, not a reflection. There are actually wings on the object, which is clearly behind the sun. Now, he stated this is deeply disturbing. The reason is that gas tails of comets follow solar winds, and they're not visible until the comet's orbit is inside of Jupiter, at which point, uh, normally the luminosity at that point of the sun makes the tails of the comet, or the planet, visible. Of course, Planet X we, we all call it Planet X or Nibiru, but it is a dwarf star. It's either a red dwarf or brown dwarf star. Now, the object, which is clearly Planet X by deductive logic and process of elimination, is therefore now between Mars and Jupiter. It's not in the outer reaches of the solar system. It can clearly be seen, especially from the southern hemisphere. Now, as of April 2015, therefore, the date of that video and the analysis, Nibiru is close enough to the sun so that the sun's light is reflected uh, to the tail, making it appearing like wings. And there's one other quick comment I'd make, because actually that uh, video had two parts. The second part was a lady who lives near where I do, Sanibel Allen, Florida, Melissa Huffman. Now you can look at this video itself on YouTube. I think it has more or less gone viral and nearly a million people have looked at it. And this is a 2015 video. The object is very interesting. She pans the sky and shows the object and then the moon. Now it's clearly a planet visible just north of the sun. Now using Stellarium and knowing the moon phases, comparing it to her video on the moon, you can go to the derived date, take away the atmosphere and the ocean, and you can determine the relationship of the stars to the horizon. So to determine the date, you basically just use moon charts. And the moon is well below the horizon in all dates after September 26, 2015. Therefore, the video was taken earlier. Now, September 2015 moon phases give us a comparable to the moon in the video. And if you look at the moon phases diagram to the actual picture of the moon, it has to have been photographed on September 23, 2015 based on moon phasing. Now, on that date, Mercury in Stellarium is very dim, somewhat above the horizon. Also, I believe it's in a different location than the unknown object. All the other planets are below the horizon. The video therefore conclusively and plainly shows an unidentified planet, or dwarf star, Planet X, of some significant magnitude quite clearly. So I can reach no other conclusion, and the analyst did himself, then this is a rare photo from this hemisphere of Planet X approaching us. Wow. You know, and there's also speculation now, and I hadn't heard this until about a year ago, that not only is Planet X going to come our way, this dwarf star, but also a bunch of planets with it, like it's bringing in its own solar system. Is there evidence or truth to that? Right. There's a number of videos. That I've seen some real good ones from the South Pole Telescope, and they indicate that there are a variety of moons around this. It's basically, as you say, it's its own solar system. A lot of people don't realize this, but binary, what we've got in our solar system here, is obviously a 
binary twin. 76%, this is a fact, of all stars are binary twins. In fact, 16% are trinary twins. There are three suns, but ours has a, a binary companion, and it comes under the name of Planet X, Nibiru, and so forth, Nemesis. There are various names to it. But ours has a binary twin, and it's uh, very common. It's extremely common, and it's basically what is approaching us. And apparently, from all descriptions, indications, reports, insider reports, photographs, and other sources of human and signal intelligence, it contains five to seven moons around it. So it's a solar system approaching our solar system, which makes it extremely dangerous. You know, and even the most recent Star Trek movie that came out, uh, they portrayed Nibiru in this movie, and the, the inhabitants of the planet were primitive. You know, they were almost like Amazon-like tribal, what you would think of from many years ago. It's just interesting how they've really kind of pushed it into the media. But for, from the skeptic standpoint, you can go back to 2003. And in 2003, supposedly Nibiru was supposed to come by the Earth and, and wipe everybody out, and then, then it didn't happen, and then it was supposed to be 2012. And one thing that I find interesting, and I'm not a religious person, but I definitely think there's a lot of correlations in the Bible, especially if you read Revelations and things that are going on today, uh, whether it's a playbook for these people or it's just prophecy, which it very well could be. You know, it talks about how nobody really knows the time when basically shit hits the fan. And with all of this crying wolf for 10, 20 years before something like that happens, I can see how the population can become really docile, you know, because they've heard it before so many times. So when it really does happen, it's almost like unbelievable. Right. There's a lot of disinformation out there. And you have to consider the sources of the disinformation, obviously. I have a feeling when people join Congress nowadays, whether they join as a senator or at the lower level, that they have a visit from a higher up or from their local NSA agent pretty quick on. And they say, you know, you're going to find out some things that we don't want you to talk about. And if you don't talk about them, guess what? We're going to give you a seat in an apartment in an underground base when this all happens. And so you don't really have anything at all. You have a complete, you know, blackout of news from uh, the so-called authorities of Washington, D.C. But again, what do you expect? You have to consider the source. Now, there's been a lot of Google and uh, NASA cover-up, in my opinion, on this. And I'll give you an example of it real quick that might sort of answer your question and, and also uh, even move us a little bit into a combination of astronomy and the Apocalypse, the book of Revelation, the last book of the Bible. So there's an object I call the Red Dragon Anomaly, which appears in the constellation Virgo. And it currently, very interestingly, mirrors the vision or biblical sign of Revelation chapter 12. Now, this is a critical, major sign. Of course, Revelation is from the highest authority, Revelation 1. John wrote it on the Isle of Patmos about 2,000 years ago. And in it, he found out that cosmologically the sun travels the ecliptic and every September it passes through the constellation Virgo. The moon also travels close by. Now, towards the end of September in 2017 next year, there is a precise configuration of the Revelation 12 imagery. And I've used Stellarium and I've gone back 6,000 years and I've gone forward a thousand years. And it's complex and involves the simultaneous interface of half a dozen astronomical variables, but it only occurs once. And that's in September of 2017, a year and a half from now. But in addition to the Revelation 12 sign as it's known, the imagery of the dragon at the feet of Virgo with the sun at the head and the moon at the feet presents itself right now very interestingly in Starry Night in real time. Now, this is highly unusual and extraordinary. The red dragon of Revelation 12 may well be, and I believe rather obviously is Planet X, as it's referred to in an earlier chapter of Revelation, I think Revelation chapter 8, in a similar manner. A colleague of mine at the university, uh, one university in the western U.S., brought up a very interesting point, perhaps a cover-up to my intention. Here it is. Basically, he said, the areas of the dragon anomaly have been covered or patched up by Google Sky in the past. 
But one of the ways to actually see what is behind this patched out area is to use a program called SkyView by NASA. SkyView, what that is, it's a virtual observatory on the net. It generates images of any part of the sky from wavelengths of all regimes, radio to gamma. You just filter it. Now, when you view these images in various filters, you can see the actual color of this anomaly in Virgo is red, and it does look very menacing as it appears to have a face like a dragon with two profound eyes. It's very intriguing and quite strange. Now, just for your listeners, I'll provide very briefly the right ascension and declination if they want to go to sky view. And here it is. Just cut and paste this coordinate. Here's the right ascension, 13 hours, 50 minutes, 44 seconds. Here's the declination, and that would be minus 8 hours, fifth, rather 13 minutes and 59.7 seconds. So right ascension is the celestial equivalent of longitude, and uh, in the sky latitude is called declination. So you just enter those coordinates, and then on sky view, you just choose the iris 100 micron telescope setting, and there you are. You've never seen an object quite like this one. Now, the sign itself might be a sweeping parenthetic of that entire biblical 70th week of Daniel, which is a key to solving the most complex cryptogram in existence, the book of the apocalypse, as to what it is the astronomical scientific community, I think is keeping a very low profile. And the question is, why did they ever cover it up to begin with? And, you know, not only that, if um, if we could get into some of the more, you know, scientific stuff as well that you talked about, that you put together, is the, in your opinion, the great flood that's talked about and has been talked about all over the world and other uh, mythos as well. Do you feel that that was caused by this orbital, you know, from Nibiru coming back many years ago, getting close to the Earth and caused some type of, you know, giant tidal waves and stuff and earthquakes? Well, it indeed could have. I'm not positive of the exact date in biblical history of Noah's flood. I think it was close to 4,000 years ago, might have been a little bit more. Uh, very good question. Now, in fact, what that question leads us into is th the main item we have historically in terms of archaeology to help us relate on a scientific basis to a prior pole shift by the Earth is something called the Nebra Sky Disk. Now, this is a 12-inch bronze disk, the Nebra Sky Disk. It may be the key to determining the last recorded time in history that Planet X actually flew by the Earth. The disk is bronze. It's inlaid with gold. Uh, it was found near Europe's oldest observatory in Gossick, Gossick, Germany. Now, the story of the disk is quite unconventional. It was found, I think, in 99, 1999, by German treasure hunters, and they were using metal detectors inside an ancient forest. However, German law dictates that all such relics are state property. So instead of turning it in, they attempted to sell it on the international market a couple of years later in 2002. Now, working for the Swiss government, an archaeologist named Harold Meller, I believe, posed as a straw buyer. The disk was seized by authorities, and then it was analyzed. Now, what it contains, it contains symbols including the sun, the moon, the constellations, I think, of Pleiades, Capricorn, Perius, and Gemini. Now, the disk reflects the sun in the position of a solar eclipse. What is causing the eclipse? Well, it's not the moon, which is on the opposite side of where it should be located. So I think the best deductive logic is that an unknown near-Earth object is causing the eclipse. Now, this 32-centimeter disk weighs about 2 kilograms. Again, it's decorated with gold leaf symbols, and the gold leaf symbols also reflect four planets, Venus, Mars, uh, I believe Jupiter, and Mercury. Now, using modern-day astronomical software, you can plot the actual day and hour the disk was produced, and the result is very precise. It was produced at April 6, 1810 BCE at 8.30 a.m. The disk was thus created during the Bronze Age, which is 3,800, I think, 26 years ago. Now, there's a curve bar at the bottom of the riverbank, the Sol River, which still currently exists. Much of the disk's current coloration is green due to a tarnishing effect. And the discovery site is a prehistoric enclosure in the Ziegelrode's Forest, known by the name of Middleburg, or Central Hill, uh, 60 kilometers, and I believe, west of Leipzig. Now, the treasure hunters stated it was found within a pit in the forest near the ancient Gothic Observatory. Now, here's something extremely interesting. A very, upon examination, the disk reflects the constellation Orion at the very bottom. 
Orion should not have been observable from that location in Germany at that time. The nearest location, in fact, from which Orion, the constellation Orion, could have been observed is Luxor, Egypt. That adds to the mystery. The only logical conclusion is that this 26 to 30 degree difference is accounted for by a simultaneous pole shift. So this mystery shrouded sky disk of Nebra is an advanced astronomical clock. It's a compendium of knowledge. And I think it gives us the best proof of the existence and passage of Planet X in the ancient world. So the purpose of the sky disk is really no longer a matter of speculation. I believe, and others believe, it's the oldest visual representation of the sky in existence. And it postulates and proves the approach of a near-Earth object causing the daytime eclipse as well as causing a major pole shift that has just occurred, and that was 3,826 years ago. And have you heard of the Sumerian tablets? Yes, I have. They were analyzed by a fellow named Zechariah Sitchin, who wrote a book called The Twelfth Planet back around 1970, 75, I believe it was. And the stuff he talks about in his books as well, when he deciphers the tablets or translates them, he talks about Planet X and Nibiru, the winged destroyer, and basically a 3,600-year orbital pattern or, you know, orbital cycle. So it's been talked about for forever, basically, you know, I mean, uh, previous generations. And it sounds to me like we're getting pretty close to where if you've got a pretty good telescope and you know where to look, you can go outside, look up in the sky, and you can see it for yourself. That is correct. Now, when it was first observed, however, back in the 80s, because it's so close now, it's, it's, a, it's different. When it was first observed, probably the first time it was actually observed, it was observed in the infrared spectrum in 1983 by a uh, orbiting Earth satellite telescope called the Infrared Astronomical Satellite. And this is when all those articles appeared in the Washington Post and the New York Times and so forth. And that's when right before blackout occurred there were some articles over a six to twelve month period of time when it was pretty much spoken freely of and then all of a sudden they i think they realized the seriousness of the matter and they went ahead and produced a blackout but a lot of times this is i think many of the instruments that are used to view this object in very great detail are for example the spitzer telescope which is in a trailing earth orbit it's of course a satellite telescope and it's infrared in the Vatican, they've got their telescope, and that's uh, infrared also. That's in Mount Graham in southeastern Arizona on the top of a 10,000-foot uh, mountain. It has several names to it. One code name, they've actually got several telescopes there. They've got a radio telescope. Uh, they're listening for extraterrestrial intelligence. And then they've got the uh, VATT telescope, and then they're also joint venturing a project that they strangely have codenamed of all names Lucifer. And right. This is a, <laughs> can you believe it? <laughs> oh yeah, I mean it doesn't. Yeah. It, to, right now, to the world we live in, it actually it's to be expected. It's, well, it's unbelievable. Uh, it's right. It is. And Father Malachi Martin, I remember an interview with him back uh, some years ago. I found out about it later, but. He interviewed, I think, with Art Bell or some radio show in 1997, and he said, we're looking for an object, we the Vatican. Now, he was a Vatican insider. He's an ex-Jesuit. He was a Jesuit. And he said, we're looking for an object that's approaching from space. The Catholic Church is, the Vatican is, and we think it's going to approach in about 20 years. Now, that was in 1997, which is 19 years ago. So uh, he basically, I believe he was a professor of paleontology at the Pontifical Biblical Institute of the Vatican, and he criticized the Vatican for not releasing the full content of the third secret of Fatima. And the presumption was the Vatican didn't want the facts known about Wormwood. Well, in any case, it just seems highly suspicious that they've invested, you know, all of this money there to, uh, why are they in the strange business of astronomy? Uh, why do they have this uh, large binocular telescope on Mount Graham? It's a near infrared telescope. Now, the cover story is, of course, they're looking for extrasolar planets and alien intelligence. But uh, they have an infrared telescope. They have to supercool it to minus 351 Fahrenheit to allow it to conduct observations. And, of course, a, a dwarf star, whether it's, you know, a red dwarf or a brown dwarf, the only difference is the size in those. Brown dwarf never reached fusion stage. It didn't convert hydrogen to helium. Uh, a, a red dwarf is anywhere from 
8% to half the size of our sun. Anything less than 8% of the size of our sun is classified as a brown dwarf. So it's one of the two. But the way to observe those is in the infrared spectrum. Uh, they do have red halos around them. But uh, to uh, determine the heat signature, you need an infrared uh, telescope. So that's what you've got. And uh, anyway, I think another Vatican insider stated that the Graham Observatory is used to study anomalous celestial bodies approaching the Earth. And uh, I think he, in an interview with him, he compared it to what the CIA did with one of its secret eyes known as the twin to Hubble, Stop. I hope. 12, Kio 12, you may have heard of, of that program. But in any case, the Vatican is set up like a government. It has its own secret intelligence agency. It's called the SIV. And uh, the English translation is the Information Service of the Vatican. And the uh, LBT, their Lucifer Telescope, is uh, two giant 28-foot diameter telescope mirrors. And it's cooled, super cooled, in order to observe near-infrared wavelength range. So the question is, you know, what do you think they're looking for? It's interesting, too, because you brought up the way that uh, a brown dwarf and a red dwarf works, and you talk about how it's very difficult to see unless you've got, you know, this, this infrared-type telescope or whatever. And I've seen so many different pictures of what could be Nibiru or some type of other anomaly, but there's a few pictures I'm thinking of in particular and the last show I did on Nibiru a few weeks ago uh, with a gentleman by the name of Bob Evans. He's got probably about a thousand different pictures that he's been given from people all, all over the world. But uh, a lot of them I look at and I say, yeah, you know, that might be lens glare. I don't know what that is. But a few of them in particular that he showed. Uh, a couple of them that I'm thinking of in specific, and I'll, I'll pull these up here in a moment if I can find them. They were like, uh, it was in Italy, and it was just this giant red circular mass. And I, you know, it, it almost looks like, okay, well, is that the sun, but somebody used some type of filtering software to make it look like that big giant red mass? But it sounds to me like Nibiru, possibly. Right. I, I know the individual you're referring to, and he is a superb investigator with an excellent reputation and track record. So I would guess that, as you say, most of his uh, photographs are, are quite genuine. And I think we've had the best photographs since about 2010, 2011. We've had superb photographs and videos in 2015. It's getting larger. I think a fellow named... Uh, yeah, it's huge. I mean, these pictures, uh, David, I'm telling you, the, it takes up half the, half the sky in that particular area of the picture. I mean, it's mind-boggling. Yes, there was a series of still photographs taken between, I believe, 2011 and 2014 by a, a certain analyst who had access to a webcam at the top of a volcano in Central America. Perhaps it was Costa Rica. And I looked at an analysis of that uh, those still photos and if you look at the field of view when you uh, if you state the pixel size at each year 2010 2011 up through 2014 in the same field of view it gets amazingly larger so obviously in my opinion the object is approaching us quite quickly you're saying that you think it's right now in between Jupiter and Mars right absolutely and I, I believe getting to one of the main points of my book for, for just a moment. Uh, not only is there a lot of scientific evidence, and, and again, uh, you look at the circumstantial evidence. You look at the, these deep underground bunkers and the missing money and, and all of these things that don't make any sense unless you use a philosophical principle called Occam's razor. The simplest solution is the most reasonable and is the one you should use. Now, getting back for just one second, maybe I can even talk a little bit about the uh, John's very apparent description in Revelation 12. It's a very precise celestial event that he talks about. Now I talked about one particular object but I didn't really talk too much about what's called the Revelation 12 sign. And he, in the Revelation chapter 12, if you read the first four verses, you'll notice those are very specific visual descriptions that are not referenced again. And it's interesting to note that to an observer on Earth, they will not be able to see this formation. 
at that on September 23rd, 2017, you won't be able to see it because the sun's brightness will clothe the entire constellation during the day, and the moon will, I think, only be illuminated about 11%. So it's a pure, specific astronomical indication. And if you look at Revelation 12, 1 and 3, the word wonder or sign is used to describe what John saw. Now, in the Greek, this has the idea of an indication. So it appears that they are based on literal visual events that the author of the apocalypse, John, saw in the heavens or the sky as an indication of what was going on in the larger scheme of things. Now, that date itself is what I call a time marker or a key to a cryptogram. It is not the final key, in my opinion. It's only a preliminary key. That's not the date, in my opinion, when you're going to see Planet X in the sky. You're going to see it at the last possible minute, and I believe I know at least the month, but maybe not the week, but I do know the month when that will most likely probably occur. And again, the analysis comes from Revelation chapter 12. And the September 23rd celestial sign of the woman in the constellation Virgo, as I mentioned, has never happened before and will never happen again. Jupiter has to move in several directions in retrograde and so forth for a period of about 400 days in a part of that constellation to fulfill that exact astronomical requirement. And that, in, in conjunction with the the 12 stars at the top of the woman's head and the, the moon at her feet and the sun and so forth. These things do not occur in exact sequence except in the month of September of 2017. So again, I would call that some sort of uh, cryptographic key that we need to proceed from. Now, remember this, the blue daytime sky is going to hide planet X until it eclipses the sun. But there is going to be a full disk solar eclipse right after September 23rd, 2017. This occurs, if you look at moon charts, on October 5th, 2017. And what happens, of course, during a full disk solar eclipse is the sky turns black. And that will reveal, at that point, that week, in my opinion, the week of October 5th to 12th, according if the book of Revelation is true, because this ties in perfectly with it, that could well be the exact month that we can first see it with the naked eye. So, in my opinion, combined with a predictive computer-generated astronomical model, the Bible, the book of Revelation, the Apocalypse, tells us that the red dragon, or planet X, or Nibiru, appears after September 23rd, 17, but it has to appear before October 11th, 2017. At that date, October 11th, 2017, the sign in Virgo, the woman Virgo, will no longer be, quote, pregnant. Then the red dragon or planet X, therefore, must make it a, an appearance before October 11th. So that seems to be a, a cutoff date. Jupiter, is, which is known as the planet or the star of the Messiah, exits Virgo, the Virgin, on October 11th, after having spent, I believe, 301 days or about 42 weeks in the, quote, womb region of that constellation. And again, after that point, the woman will no longer be pregnant. So that gives us a very narrow window, just to use the uh, book of Revelation or the Apocalypse as sort of an intel briefing. And the great sign of the woman, as described in Revelation 12, 1 to 2, forms and lasts for a few hours. And according, again, to astronomical models, this sign has never before occurred in human history. It will occur once on September 23rd, 27. It will never occur again. And I believe it places us right at the time frame from that analysis of the Planet X approach to the Earth. So I believe this is something very interesting that's covered in a lot of detail in the book. And I believe, though, if I'm not mistaken, the individual you just referenced, uh, Bob, I believe he also believes that 2017 is highly likely. You know, that's what he said in the interview. And, uh, you know, he also correlated a lot of revelations and stuff. And it sounds to me like you've definitely done your homework. Uh, are you a religious person? Well, I would say yes. Okay. And I, 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 but I never really studied the book of Revelation okay. until a few years ago, until I, until I got into Planet X. I, first of all, it didn't make any sense to me. I, I, I've... Look, glanced at it once or twice, but it didn't seem to make it. Didn't seem to uh, to solve, as you would say in cryptography. 
So it made no sense until I started relating it to this particular object and correlating what the Bible calls the red dragon with also what it's called wormwood. These are all terms referring to Planet X or Nibiru. They're all the same thing. The Vatican calls it wormwood. Revelation calls it the red dragon. Revelation chapter 8 again calls it wormwood. But these terms are interchangeable. So obviously this is a major astronomical sign that's going to have some very high impact value at a certain point in our history. Uh, you know, the Earth is has been around many thousands of years and everything's going okay so far and the end is not necessarily going to occur but things are certainly going to change and there's going to be major cataclysms and the earth is actually very cataclysmic in its nature uh, only half a million years ago uh, there was a, a pole shift six million years ago there was a pole shift six million years ago understand the state of Alaska was near the equator what we now know is the equator so the 65 million years ago, as you know, there was a, a major asteroid collision near Mexico, and scientists say, well, that wiped out the dinosaurs because it caused ash to cover the sky and it destroyed plant and animal life. So we really live in a very cataclysmic universe. And the interesting thing about these asteroids, that, a, that Planet X has a, a, a tail anywhere from a quarter million miles to several million miles long, and it's a the dust of that planet is red iron oxide, but the tail, especially as it passes through the asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter, picks up a lot of asteroids, some large, some small, some kilometers in, in diameter. And these items, the U.S. and the world actually has nothing at all to protect against an asteroid collision. There is, you, you can't shoot a nuclear weapon at it because all it would do is break it up into more pieces and you'd have more targets hitting the same area. There's no early warning system. There's no way really to protect against this. Yeah, I mean, you'd almost have to find a way to send something that could move it, you know, hook up some thruster system to it and have it blast off the opposite direction because obviously inertia, yeah, you, you shoot a missile at it and then it's just going to be a million other pieces that are going to fire onto the Earth. So, huh. Very right, and that they haven't discovered that yet to my knowledge they're probably working on it and they might have it in 50 years but I, I don't think they have it yet yeah I mean absolutely who knows what they have so how far before you think I mean do you think in 2017 it's gonna be chaos on earth do you think that uh, it's basically gonna be blowing up you know earthquakes ten times more than they are now what's gonna happen a year from now right well at that point I would prepare now here, here's something very strange I would prepare on or before the fall of 2017. Uh, I would conduct emergency preparedness. Of course, you want to be spiritually ready. You want to have a clear conscience and all that. But you need to do physical preparations as well. I think uh, survival gear, emergency food, that sort of thing. And the reason is uh, that, again, all, all this while you're going to get ex increasing levels of disinformation from the mass media until it's actually there. And then they're going to say, whoops, we didn't have any notice, we don't know what happened, and so forth. And they're going to run and hide in what they've already established. But, you know, the public is there and the public has to fend for itself. Uh, this global warming is you've heard, I'm sure, is a cover story. The Earth is heating up from the core outward because of the approach of Planet X. During the 20th century, I think there were 35 volcanic eruptions in a typical year. Now there are more than 35 of these every single day. So basically, when X approaches, that week you see it in the sky, let's say it's October of 2017, you know, for purposes of discussion. At that point, it's not going to actually collide, I don't believe, with the Earth. The Earth is only 8,000 miles in diameter. It may have passed 5, 10, 15 million miles away. But it has a very high magnetic attraction. It's going to have a gravitronic effect. It's going to cause the shifting of the Earth's crust. Uh, it's going to cause major volcanic activity. It's going to cause tidal waves. And when a pole shift happens, the ocean literally comes up out of its basin. So, you're going to have major weather changes, seismic activity, and volcanic eruptions. Probably at that point, Yellowstone, the, the Yellowstone Super Caldera, will likely erupt. That could affect up to a third of the United States, covered with ash. You're going to, right now, you've got unexplained sinkholes, bizarre weather. Uh, so, 
we've seen these core changes and of course the cover story the legend that uh, were given by you know Al Gore and those types is global warming well of course that's just a total story and it, it makes absolutely no logical or deductive sense well let me jump in here for a second I'm glad you brought that up because you can clearly tell a difference now with how hot the Sun is I mean even if you look at the same temperature, you know, 75 degrees now versus 75 degrees 10 years ago. Although it's the same temperature, the sun on your skin even, it feels, it, there's just more heat there. It's almost like the atmosphere has become depleted. It's thinner now, so more of that radiation is actually hitting your skin. And I've got proof of that because I have a, a radiation detector built into my watch. I mean, it's a, it's a high-end military-grade watch. You can pick one up at MTM Special Ops, and everywhere I go, I can see what the radiation levels are. And just over the past three years, they've literally doubled in my area out here in San Antonio, Texas. So it's very interesting. I'm wondering if the chemtrails might have something to do with that. But the sun also seems more extreme now. So, well, it, you know, what is your thoughts on that? Good points. Very good points. Let me comment on the uh, the EMP, and let me comment on the sun. First of all, actually, if you go to the book of uh, Revelation, the uh, Revelation indicates that the sun is going to be hotter at that time frame. Now, the EMP effect, Planet X has a massive tail. It's fantastically charged. It's magnetic. The tail has moons and rocks in it. Now, this can down aircraft and satellite when it passes. It can affect the electrical grid. Now, of course, NASA, JPL, and the other disinformation sources ignore this. Here's the, here are the facts. The Earth has a nickel and iron core. Now, this generates its magnetic field. However, the magnetosphere has large holes in it. The magnetosphere is a static shield. Now, under routine solar conditions, it protects the Earth from coronal mass ejections. But when Planet X arrives, we're no longer under routine solar conditions. Now, you look at... Uh, Air France, for example, um, I think that was back in 2009, Air France 447. This is a little bit off topic, but really it's on topic because it's an excellent metaphor, an excellent visual type of illustration as to the power of Planet X. When Planet X hits, the utilities are going to be shut down for anywhere from three months on. There's going to be $5 trillion worth of damage to the electrical grid. But let's go back to Air France 447 back in 2009 to give you an example. There have been people that have postulated, these are very intelligent people, and it's just a theory, but they have postulated that that disappeared over the mid-Atlantic range, right in the middle of the ocean. Now, that's involved with the Earth's earthquakes. The EMP between the mid-Atlantic range and Planet X could have caused its destruction. And the same thing with Malaysian flight, ME370. It may have flown into an EMP pulse. The flight path was highly irregular. That's indirect evidence. And this occurs when the north pole of Planet X is pointed directly at the Earth during its approach. Magnetrons and electrons burned out through an EMP event. I think the cell phones of the passengers as well burned out. So none of the theories really answer uh, in terms of those aircraft. All the questions are fully explained what happened that day. But it could be an indirect effect of the approach of Planet X. Now also, you mentioned these um, chemtrails. Now, there's a site, I just became aware of it recently, called Geoengineering Watch. I think Dane... Yeah, Wayne, great guy. Oh, you know him, okay. Yeah, I've talked to him before. Oh, you've talked to him, excellent. Well, you've you've probably heard the key phrase, indigo skyfold and so forth, and I, I understand that contrails dissipate quickly, but not chemtrails. And I always, you know, tell people, you know, in terms of NSA, nothing is as it appears to be. Always consider the source and their agenda. You, you look at Ted Gunderson, that former FBI chief, and he he said Congress should be investigating these chemtrails. And uh, Yeah, that so, was back in 97. That He actually came out and talked to Congress about it. Weather wars, chemtrails, everything. Really, I didn't keep up too much with the chemtrails controversy, but it's, it's likely what? Strontium, aluminum, oxide, and so forth? Barium salts, all sorts of other nanoparticulates. They were putting GMO, Ebola virus crap in there. I mean, there's it just depends on the day and the time and the location. But I, I do got to bring this up, too, because I've noticed for the past several days, the, the skies have been chemtrail-free. At least if they were doing it, they were doing it at nighttime when you couldn't see it because... You didn't have the haze. You didn't see the those nanoparticulates falling from the skies when they do the heavy chemtrail spray, and you can see with your polarized sunglasses on. So I'm wondering why, and I'm wondering if the chemtrails that they do 
have a part of trying to block out Nibiru if it's visible to the naked eye sometimes. I think that's very possible. I think they're attempting every type of disinformation possible. For example, let's look at what happened recently. Uh, and let's give you a little history on this. And you, you probably uh, know a lot of this, but for your listeners, you know, science admits quite a few points in favor of Planet X. Our, our solar system is surrounded by the Oort cloud, 50 to 200,000 AU astronomical units or Earth sun distances from our sun. And if if our sun is part of a binary system, which it is, and you have a common center of mass, this can disturb the Oort cloud and send comets or whatever toward us. Now, science also admits an asteroid impact is absolutely responsible for the extinction of the dinosaurs about 65 million years ago in the Tunguska effect or event in Russia in 1908. I think that explosion had 1,000 times the power of the atomic bomb dropped on Hiroshima, flattened 80 million trees, 830, 840 square miles. Now, here's the thing. Science admits a recently discovered dwarf planet named Sedna has an extra long and a rather unusual elliptical orbit around the sun. I think it's 76 to 900 AU. And Sedna's orbit is estimated 12,000 years. Uh, Mike Brown of Caltech said Sedna's location doesn't make any sense. Sedna shouldn't be there. There's no way to put Sedna where it is. It never comes close enough to be affected by the sun, but it never goes far enough to be affected by the stars. Now, this, this fellow Brown is part of a Caltech team that claims to have discovered the ninth planet earlier this year, in 2016. And, and as you know, Pluto's been demoted. It's no longer considered a planet. But Brown's calculations suggest Nemesis, or the ninth planet, whatever they want to call it, is ten times the mass of Earth. Now, science also knows, as I mentioned, that binary star systems are very common in our galaxy. And red dwarfs are very common. They're the most common type of star in the galaxy. So the existence of Planet X, the Planet X system, is therefore quite in line with the current knowledge base. But to wrap it up, this so-called ninth planet recently disclosed in January of this year by the NASA people, never a straight answer, is a combination, in my opinion, of information and disinformation. It's what we would call in the intel community a Bush League type of propaganda. My advice to anybody thinking about this or thinking about doing too much research on on this, uh, quote, discovery of the ninth planet, don't major on miners. Don't, I don't study their announcement too much or pay much attention to it. Now, the real planet X is in the vicinity of Mars and fast approaching Earth. It has no direct relationship or indirect relationship to this recent discovery. And this so-called discovery is just one more piece of evidence, in my opinion, that the powers that be are running scared and making mistakes as they go. Well, certainly making mistakes as they go sounds like a, a, a common theme for them, you know, and, and also you look at so much today as far as pollution and, you know, just, just the fracking that's going on around the world right now. There's so much oil that's available. They're running out of space to put it. And if those things go, you know, it's it, it, those fracking systems. And like, let's look at L.A., for example, all the methane that's getting leaked out there. There's just this huge emergency. It's not really being talked about much now. It was a few weeks ago, but now it's hush hush. You know, who knows how many people are going to be affected by that. You've got these nuclear reactors next to fault lines. I think there's 55 nuclear reactors next to the Madrid fault line alone. You've got, right. you know, the San Andreas fault line and. You look at Fukushima and what happened out there and how much pollution uh, to the environment from these nuclear active particulates that are just all over the place now. And I wonder what's going to happen, like you said, if there's just this giant blackout and if power isn't available to these nuclear facilities or if there's an earthquake and some of these reactors get uh, you know, affected by it, how are they going to keep the rods cool? What happens if Carlsbad, New Mexico, where they've got just tons and tons of nuclear waste there what happens if something goes out there you know what's next how do people protect themselves is it do they even want to be protected or would they be better off just dying quickly well very good points you know uh there's the uh, the fellow i'm sure you've heard of jr moore the radio show and he's interviewed some u.s navy veterans and they were told the end results of all this but they really weren't told the why of it and he was told it on a discreet basis you may have seen the u.s navy map of future america where the coasts yeah. are flooded and so forth well now you know that the magnetic poles have been shifting towards russia at maybe 40 miles an hour a year but when planet x arrives the physical poles will shift now this this will create some hyper earthquakes tsunamis 
and, and the shifting of land masses. So if you want to look at a few different states, one, one thing people can do to protect themselves is simply be in the right location when it happens. Now, there's a few states to avoid. And California is highly dangerous. It's, it's composed of rock plates. Now, when rock is compressed, it breaks. And you'll see the crumbling of rock, of course, as this mass goes upwards. Now, the West Coast will have major catastrophic changes, synergistic proportions, tidal waves, high hurricane force winds, earthquakes on the fault lines, volcanic activity over the magma, forest fires caused by, the, you know, the, uh, the, the, what's in the tail of Planet X, and also caused by volcanic explosions, severe lightning storms. So it's highly dangerous. And I think the long-term danger is in riding out the shifts for those who are living near the boundaries of plates. Now, cities without mountains as a backdrop can just be washed out to sea. Uh, you'll have broken gas and water lines. San Francisco, it's on the San Andreas and other fault lines. A lot of the population will be trapped. Water will overflow the city. Survival will be minimal. California is not a good bet. Now, the area around Arizona, on the other hand, uh, the Hoover Dam probably won't survive because of earthquake activity. And you'll have rivers flooding, and areas within rivers should probably be avoided. But you look at Phoenix and some of these main cities. Arizona has withstood many a pole shift. The area around Tucson is safe. Florida is another very dangerous state. Its highest elevation is 105 meters in the panhandle. And, uh, but as for Central and South Florida and the Keys, these parts can be devastated by a tide of water. Colorado, for example, is a safe area. The domestic division of the CIA is relocating to Colorado. That should give you know viewers many clues right there. Right. Eastern Colorado, you know, has descends into plains, has rivers. Some of these may be a port of safety. And of course, one of the safest parts of the country is the Ozarks, northern Arkansas, southern Missouri. Average elevation close to a thousand feet, self-sufficient water supply, agricultural land, they'll do well. They're also isolated from large metropolitan areas and they're well enough inland to avoid flooding through, you know, tidal waves. So it's a part of the preparation is probably geographic but I would expect when it hits when you see this object in the sky you'll have one to two days to accumulate all of the emergency food and water you can I would accumulate at least a three month supply now the strange thing is about this whole thing is that Congress could have done something about this electrical grid it, it, it could solve it for three four five hundred million dollars they've never done anything to harden it the, the military has parts of their grid hardened but the Congress has never done anything, and yet they know that the estimate of a three-month downward collapse of the U.S. electrical grid will cost the nation in excess of $5 trillion. So uh, I, I don't understand the thinking, but this is Congress, you know, so <laughs> that's it. I think they're probably trying to protect themselves as well. Maybe they are being offered a, a nice you know, one-bedroom apartment, about 15 right. stories underground, and they'll be okay. They won't have to worry about anything during the, the catastrophe. But, I mean, how long is this going to last? Well, the effects could last as long as the electrical grid is down. When the electrical grid is down, as you know, uh, you'll have a certain percentage of automobiles that simply and trucks that will simply fail because of the EMP pulse. Uh, the an EMP pulse, for, for your listeners who maybe are not too familiar with it, it basically uh, can occur several ways. One way it can occur is through a nuclear explosion. For example, if North Korea were to uh, have a rogue container ship or something like that, and they were outside the continental United States, or Russia had a drone submarine, and they exploded a nuclear weapon of a certain tonnage, a certain blast radius, 250 miles above Kansas City, it would basically knock out 99% of our electrical grid, as well as part of Mexico and Canada. But uh, an EMP effect from the sun, a solar flare, can do that as well. And let me explain a little bit about solar flares. The biggest flares to date are called X-class flares. And now Y-class exists, but they're off the charts. Now, as I mentioned, the Earth is surrounded by the magnetosphere. It begins at a
Thank you.